Um, this is the uh, Patty uh, area where we're standing. And Jonathan Patty had a wooden house built here. His grandfather bought the property in 1734. His name was Seth. And after Seth, it went to his son named Seth, and then to Jonathan, the grandson. And um, the house was approximately 40 feet long by about 20 feet wide. Uh, on this side, uh, to my left here, you can see bricks from a fire from a chimney. Actually, his fireplace was right there. And what Patty did, or his grandfather did, is they built a little wall here, and they used that as a center support for his house. The wall's been added in; it's not part of the original wall structure, and it consists of smaller rocks than the um, than the um, rocks in the original wall. And he also, we feel, blocked off what was at one time a stone staircase with a small section of wall right here. There's a set of, uh, I believe it's five stairs that go down and by, with a tripod sitting. And they go down, and this would have been probably the entranceway to this courtyard. And the courtyard would have been surrounded by a couple of stone chambers, which um, are still here today. And um, over, to the, over in that direction, you can see uh, where the plastic is on that structure. They were doing an excavation in the 1990s, and they found another fireplace hearth up there, made out of brick. So Patty had two fireplaces, one at each end of the house. In the center of the house, we found remains of a wood stove, uh, pieces of cast iron that were found. So he probably had a couple different heating sources for the house. Uh, Patty uh, was a retired shoemaker or cord winer. He was a town tax collector. He took in the town paupers in the 1830s, and he also was an abolitionist, the Underground Railway. And during the 1930s, when archaeological work began here, we found quite a few of Patty's uh, artifacts, as well as um, manacles. And the manacles possibly came from the slaves. They may have been with the slaves till they arrived at Mr. Patty's house, and then they were removed, and then they ended up being buried here, and we found them in the 1930s, almost 100 years later. Also, uh, this site was written about as the underground of Massachusetts by Wilbur Seibert, and he talks about how uh, slaves would come out of uh, Shawshine Village. They would travel north. Mr. Patty would hear a knock on his door, probably at night, because it was all done in secrecy. And then the slaves would be, would be kept here for a day or two, and then they would travel further northward, eventually reaching Canada. So it has a lot of interesting history to it, and while Patty was here, uh, the quarrymen were here. He probably invited them here to remove stones, and he might have made some money on this uh, proposition. And today we think perhaps up to 50% of the site was taken away during the Patty time period, which is very unfortunate because uh, of all the damage that was done to the site. Patty died in 1849. Uh, about 1855, uh, some damage was done to his house by a fire. And it's now believed that the whole house wasn't consumed by fire, that in fact what was remaining of it was probably uh, taken apart and hauled down the street. And uh, there's a couple places down that street where, the, where these homes exist today that are old that this wood may have ended up going into, one in particular. Um, so that after Patty's died, uh, this land here uh, was timbered by a gentleman named Nathaniel H. Paul. And uh, it was still part of the Patty family for quite a few years. It wasn't until the uh, 1920s when it finally left the Patty family. Mr. Goodwin purchased the site in 1936. He began excavating the site. He was the first researcher on the site. He died in 1950. And in the 1950s, Malcolm Pearson inherited the site from Mr. Goodwin. And he had an uh, organization called the Early Sites Foundation. It was formed in 1954, and it lasted until 1964. And uh, it consisted of some interesting individuals. One of them was a great Arctic explorer from uh, Dartmouth College. And uh, I always mispronounce his name. It was something like Veljimer Stephenson. And uh, Hugh Morrison was another gentleman from Dartmouth. And it was, uh, consisted of uh, people from all walks of life, including those two gentlemen. And they were interested in the site. They did quite a bit of work on the site in uh, the mid-1950s. And in uh, 1964, um, there was a new group formed called the New England Antiquities Research Association. And they're still they're coming up on their 40th anniversary. They have over 600 members of the organization. And they research uh, sites all over the Northeast, and, um, including this site. And that's where a lot of the information that we've talked about today came from.